And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a Morris Federation online event. And today, in the last of our winter talks for 22-23, we have Mike Heaney um, giving us um, a few stories from his latest book, The Ancient English Morris Dance. So over to you, Mike, please. OK, I'll share the screen. Have you ever got the screen? Well, thank you, everybody. And um, as a disclaimer at first, I will say that if you've read the book, you're not going to learn much new. But I am possibly, it's the same, the same words, but not necessarily in the same order. You couldn't put it like that. A more than wise approach. Okay. Um, well, for those of you who don't know, um, this is a picture of the pivotal moment um, in Morris dance history. It's painted by a, a contemporary editor and quarry Morris Dunn, Anthony Morris, um, in 1999 to celebrate the centenary of that day in Boxing Day 1899, when Cecil Sharp, staying with his mother-in-law in Headington, encountered the Headington Quarry Morris dancers and their musician on the day, William Kimber, on concertina. And there they are with the men dancing in the background and Cecil Sharp taking his notepad out and... Uh, he seems to have taken his eye patch off, but there we are. Um, and this was the moment, of course, that Cecil Sharp was inspired to revive Morris dancing. Except, of course, I think most of you know here that it wasn't. Um, he collected some tunes from Kimber um, the next day, used the tunes to compose an orchestral suite for small orchestra, and then he moved on. And it wasn't until 1905 that a London social worker called Mary Neal asked him about folk dances for her working class girls to perform he remembered Kimber, puts her in touch with him, and she kicked off the Morris Revival, in which Sharp, of course, then became the leading proponent, recovering dances from all around the South Midlands over the next 20 years. But what when he encountered it, he didn't really know what he was looking at. He'd seen nothing like it. Uh, and the perception that the, at the time was that this was something on the brink of oblivion. And in 1883, Encyclopedia Britannica had declared it extinct, um, saying it was now wholly discontinued. Um, but of course, was it? I want to explore some of the things that were happening, um, especially in the last few years of the 19th century, just before Sharp had his encounter. Now, Sharp's encounter didn't occur in a cultural vacuum. And although he's one, the one who's come to symbolise the discovery of Morris, if I can put it like that, there were currents in the air leading towards it. Maybe if it hadn't been him, it would have been somebody else. And, and the first of those currents was Darcy Ferris. Um, and uh, he was looking for authentic Morris dancers um, for his Merry England pageants and fate. And he created the Shakespearean Bitford Morris dancers and toured with them in 1886. And, and there they are outside the Falcon Inn. And uh, Darcy Ferris is the one in the background standing on the cart as, as Lord of Misrule. Um, they faded from wider public view after that. The, the 1886 door was not particularly successful. Um, but they did continue in existence um, into the 1890s and into the early 1900s as well. And Sharp's other forerunner was Percy Manning. And he researched Morris dancing as a social custom and in 1897 published an account including pictures of the Bampton Morris um, performing in that year and this is one of them um, and Bampton was of course just one of two Oxfordshire teams that were still dancing without interruption from South Midland Morris um, from the heyday up to the time of Sharp's encounter. Uh, Bampton was one and um, the other was Ensham of course and here's a picture of Ensham dancing outside the gate at Blenheim Palace um, around about 1900. And uh, th this was um, a photograph taken and probably by the artist William Nicholson, maybe by somebody else, but the artist William Nicholson certainly saw it and went on to paint the scene. And uh, you can see what he did there. He makes the dancers a third of the size that they really were against the gate of the palace. Um, so it does show that Morris dancers could come to public notice in other ways than Sharp's chance encounter. 
Um, soon after that photograph of the Bampton Morris in 1897, I showed you a moment ago, Percy Manning did something else which led directly to Sharp's encounter. He found an old photograph, this one, of the Headington Quarry team, um, taken around 1875. And on finding some of the dancers were still alive, in fact, most of them were, um, Manning got, got them together for a concert in the Corn Exchange in Oxford in March 1899, playing much on the antiquarian theme as Darcy Ferris had done. The local newspaper tagged them Ye Olde Heading Tone Morris Dancers, and uh, this was a designation they adopted themselves in their advertisement and performances. And the team continued to perform after the concert, and so it was they turned up at Sandfield Cottage in Headington on that Boxing Day a few months later. So Sharp's encounter was not entirely out of the blue. Um, it happened because of, there was a, a burgeoning antiquarian interest in Morris dancing. And what Sharp saw, of course, was South Midland Morris. Um, and you, you know all this, really, I, I'm sure. You know, South Midland Cotswold Morris, characterised by complex steps, slow capers, distinct tunes linked to distinct dances. Um, Here's Bampton. Um, and it is, it is by the closest lineal descendant of the earlier Morris, of the kind, the, the Shakespearean Morris that Darcy Fellows was trying to recreate. Um, the, the, the one that you find in the Tudor and Stuart sources. And it was focused on the Wits and Ale, a village festival. An 18th century account describes them how they wore a short, sorry, a shirt, closely pleated buckskins, white linen breeches, cotton stockings, and pumps. Bells fixed on the outside of each leg, the whole dress tastefully adorned with ribbons and white handkerchiefs to use in dancing. But it was close to dying out by the end of the 19th century when Sharp saw it, consequent upon the decline of the Whitson Ale itself. Whitson Ales had died out around the middle of the century and without the support of a wider community festival, dancers struggled to recoup the substantial expenditure of costumes, musicians, etc. Um, then, of course, um, he could also have encountered Northwest Morris, often in clogs, slings or wands um, instead of handkerchiefs. And uh, the wands, in fact, evolved from the slings, which are in this picture. Um, steps and kicks often danced um, in processions down the road. And it was undergoing a revival in the 1890s when Sharp met Head in the Quarry. Um, and it was evolving. But we'll come back to that aspect of it later. And suffice it to say for now that Cecil Sharp ignored it. And then, of course, you've got Border. Like the South Midlands Morris, this was on its last legs by the end of the century. Um, it was more or less dying out. And the characteristic elements had diluted into a wider form of street entertainment, including mumming, blackface minstrelsy, um, which is where the blackfaces crept in. And by the end of the century, it was primarily a begging custom. Um, but nonetheless, it was seen and commented on. Um, for example, the Birmingham Daily Post, February 1895, where they report the severe weather in Bridge North is becoming serious as the supply of water is exceedingly scarce and the distress is great. Many of the unemployed going round the town as Morris dancers in order to get food and fire and firewood. So in that 1895, you could still see them around, certainly. Of course, what you see today is a largely a 1970s reinvention. Ah. This is possibly less expected. Um, this is Ride Carnival in 2022. Um, these aren't Morris dancers, at least I don't think they are. Although with Boss Morris, it may soon be uh, what we're looking at. And um, I'm showing you a picture of Ride Carnival in 2022 because I haven't got a picture from the 1880s when the carnival began. However, here's the programme for the second year, um, 1888. And that, that procession included an Arab chief, um, Red Riding Hood with performances en route, 12 ghosts, the Ride Town Band, 12 Morris dancers, 100 children with Chinese lanterns, tambourines and other delights. So, and you can see here that the, um, the chairman and treasurer was one W. Gibbs. And the following year, he was sued by a local tailor, a Mr. Griffiths. And the participants in 1889 had been organised into different troops and there were Morris dancers again, 12 Morris dancers in grotesque and fancy dresses, dancing and singing. 
that another troupe consisted of eight dancing birds covered with bells ridden by four gentlemen and four ladies dressed as frogs, foxes, dogs, cats and rabbits. These birds also danced Sir Roger de Coverley. The mind boggles. Three months later, Mr Griffiths the tailor successfully sued Mr Gibbs the carnival treasurer. Griffiths had spent five shillings and sixpence on twelve suits for the Morris dancers, who were all men, but, he said, he had also had to train the dancers, and he says time at rehearsals, going to Shanklin to teach eight Morris dancers to dance the Roger de Coverley also merited payment. And it's quite clear that in his mind at least, dancing birds covered with bells and ridden by assorted animals were just as much Morris dancers as the twelve in ordinary grotesque dresses. And that Roger de Coverley was indeed a Morris dance. And this does open our eyes to the idea that at the end of the 19th century, people could encounter Morris dancing in all sorts of different ways, some of them more unfamiliar to us now than others. But it's time to look in more detail, I think, at those 19th century carnivals. May festivals, of course, were very popular during the 19th century. And on the left here, we've got a picture of Morris dancers from one of the leading London theatres uh, dancing at the Crystal Palace in the mid-century. And this kind of display did continue for the rest of the century. One advertisement spoke of the once famous Morris dancers with gay ribbons and jingling bells and short stick evolutions and a maypole dance. And the same sort of thing was happening at a newly instigated well-dressing festival in Buxton. Here, the, a male team um, started off the custom in the 1840s was replaced by a girls team after a few years. And this is a picture of them dancing in 1864. But again, the dancing continued and was still going on at the end of the century. And the innocence of the scene was emphasized with one newspaper recording their little feet dancing the merry dance as they move along ever and anon waving gay garlands over their heads. In 1853, the girls were reported as being between 10 and 15. 1855, they were about 10 years old, and in 1856, the youngest was little more than four years old. So the press and the organisers were heavily promoting the young innocence imagery, contrasting it with the adult and juvenile male dancers. Um, and in 1855, the girls were judged a great improvement on a lot of lubberly hobbity hoys who seldom get through the dance without a blunder. So, and, and as I say, this the Buxton Festival was still going on with Morris dancers of this type in, uh, all the way to the end of the century. Um, perhaps um, the nadir in decline was Hengler's Circus in Liverpool um, presenting Morris dancing on horseback uh, and the company was still presenting the spectacle in its staging of the Dunmo Revels when the reporter for the Era newspaper was impressed. He says so many animals are employed in this that the marvel is how the rapid evolutions as they thread the mazes of the dance are gone through without hitch or accident. And another report from 1874 mentions the ladies and gentlemen on horseback and the ease and rapidity with which they execute complicated and constantly changing movements. And this suggests that the riders were executing a placid maypole dance. And here we are, um, thanks to Andy Turner for this picture. This is a musical ride, the maypole. So this is, I think, very much what is envisaged as the Morris dance on horseback. And all this activity um, led to several professional and se semi-professional dance troupes springing up in dancing schools. And uh, on the left, we've got Miss Lizzie Gilbert's Lilliputian Ballet Troupe, um, 12 strong, and they offered their successful summer spectacle, a May Day festival or rustic revels on the village green, introducing Roger de Coverley, the garland dance, maypole plotting, the Morris dance, and many other picture, pretty and picturesque groupings. This was at Bristol Zoo in 1870. And they, they offered very similar fare at Sire and Sester a month later in, in this advertisement. And these were often package entertainments. You could hire a wholesale set of entertainers to entertain at your um, local fate. And this led to the popularity in the 1880s and 1890s of the fancy dance repertoire, which operated both as, as an amusement of recreation and a dis as display. And here's the advertisement for Madame and Mrs. Demery's private academy of dancing and deportment. Um, and this was in Bedford. Um, 
and they offered Morris dancing of the present century in 1894, followed later by a new Morris dance. And they also offered special terms for school enrollments. The academies were not only teaching children. When the pupils and friends of Miss Henderson and Miss Colford, the well-known professors of dancing, put on the last dance of their season at Hampstead Conservatoire in 1897, um, the children performed various fancy dances, including a skirt dance and a hornpipe, but the adults performed others and the adults had a Morris dance in their performances. And uh, of course, in 1897, who was the director of the Hampstead Conservatoire? Cecil Sharp. Well, you may well have seen this. And it's not surprising that with all these middle class people learning Morris dancing in dancing schools, it should appear at society balls. This isn't a picture of a society ball, it's a picture of the Ilmington Morris men, Sam Bennett. Um, but um, and it's from 1906, but their linked handkerchief dance may be a spillover from such balls. For example, the juvenile party that was arranged by the Marchioness of Salisbury at Hatfield House on New Year's Eve in 1874 involved dressing up to represent Queen Elizabeth's court. And in this case, pairs of dancers held a ribbon between them. The and the newspaper reports the different couples circling in and out beneath the bright ribbons they held above their heads. So they were doing what sounds very much similar to a linked handkerchief dance. And uh, the, the great guru on fancy dress balls was a, a lady named Arden Holt. And she suggested in 1888 that the Morris dance is carried out after the fashion of the Pavan, all the dancers wearing bells. In 1897, she advocated something different. Those who take part in Morris dance must be dressed in the costume of Edward III's time and go through a sort of country dance with a toe and heel step waving handkerchiefs over their heads. And from the mid-1890s, the predominant form of society balls seems to have been the dancers individually holding long ribbons that they waved through the air. And we have a couple of uh, accounts of balls that capture the atmosphere. Here's one. Um, an account of two balls in Cheshire in 1894, and one at Peckforth and then one at Alton. And we, we are told that picturesqueness was very happily introduced into the up-to-date prosaic atmosphere of a country ball the other day. And I do not doubt that the Morris dance will ere long rival the Pas de Quatre in popularity, even in London. The dance is less of a romp than Sir Roger de Coverley. The dancers stand in two long lines holding the ends of gaily coloured ribbons, which they twist and turn about in the maze of the measure. The waving of arms and the fluttering of rainbow ribbon ends through the air has a very charming effect. Merriment reigned both at Peckfold and at Alton when the Morris dance was in full swing. Everybody voted it capital fun. So, you know, people were doing Morris dances all over the place and in all sorts of contexts. So for nearly 25 years, William Birch's operetta, um, The Merry Men of Sherwood Forest, was very popular work. It received its first performance in 1867 and was staged at least 50 times, uh, which I've been able to trace in the remainder of the century, often in concert performances. And not unnaturally, it had a Morris dance um, in which um, in, in, the, in the operetta, Robin and Maid Marian come together underneath the trysting tree on May Day and they are married. Um, they have a Morris dance and this is the tune of it. This is probably the first time this has been heard in 120 years. Enough of that. No, or not enough of that. I can't stop it now. Okay, enough of that. Um, the dance proper, uh, to which that was the tune, is followed immediately in the libretto by the song We'll Dance and We'll Sing. And that, that too was often described as being part of the Morris dance in the press. 
Um, so here are the words. So and this one you can sing along. Um, you're all, all on mute, I think. So you sing to your heart's content. Oh, it's gone. Where's it gone? I'm not getting this one. Apologies. I don't know why we're getting not getting that one. It's just the same as the other. Apologies on that. Um, anyway, I, I I can't sing it. We'll dance and we'll sing to the pipe and the table. We'll sing and we'll dance neath the twisting tree. Park the Rebec gay disowning. You get the you get the idea. Anyway, um, give it one more go, just as a. No, I'm sorry, it's gone. I don't know why. Okay. Um, when Birch's operetta was staged at a choral concert in Tewkesbury in 1870, the newspaper reported a Morris dance chorus seemed to electrify the audience, and it was encored. And at the Reading Choral Union concert a month later, it seemed to carry the audience away and was again encored. When it went to Ashton under Line, however, in Manchester, near Manchester, the Morris dance in the second act was a decided failure and by no means equal to the occasional gambles of our rush cart lads. And this is actually a feature of some of these reports of concerts. The performances are received rapturously, except in the Northwest where they're contrasted unfavorably with local Morris dancing. Birch's operetta was eclipsed, however, by Edward German's incidental music to Henry VIII. Um, first performed in 1892. Um, his three dances, Morris dance, shepherd dance and torch, torch dance, proved enormously popular. And the Morris dance was performed either alone or more often with the other dances nearly 350 times over the next eight years. On the same day, in August 1894, it was performed at the Lowestoft Marine Regatta and the Eckington Flower Show in Derbyshire. Two days later, it was at an end of the pier concert in Hastings. And like Birch's piece, frequently featured in school concerts and is still being played a century later. This is, I hope this one, we get the sound on this one. Yes, we do. This is one of the worst recordings because it's one I can use on a Creative Commons license. Go to YouTube for better recording. For that. Um, in fact, if you look, there were over 20 other compositions called Morris Dance published in the second half of the 19th century, most of these in the last five years of the century. There are two that I'd, be, I'd love to find I haven't found. One was a Morris Dance published in Preston, um, and given the fact that the North West Morris was often um, more linked to the community than other forms. I'd love to find that one, but fair to find it yet. And another one, another one was published in Salisbury, um, which may well again have some local connection. So if if you if you find these Morris dances, please let me know. Um, the publisher J. Kerwin and Sons brought out an action song called "The Merry Morris Dancers" for performance by children in schools. It was usually acted out by six boys, though larger numbers of uh, recorded and girls performances too. So, for example, at the annual concert at Tewkesbury by children attending the British schools in 1894, it was described as an action song by six boys, their lively motions and bright dresses making quite a pretty scene. So far, I've failed to find a copy of this. It's not even in Kerwin's own archives. So if you ever find the Mary Morris dance, dancers action song, 
please do let me know. Sometimes, oh yeah, sometimes the um, the different worlds almost collided. Um, here's the Wellington Journal on um, 9th of February 1895. On page five, it has a piece about a charity concert held to provide funds for charities supporting those laid out of work by the severe frost and Germans Morris dance and Shepherd's dance were played as a violin solo by Miss Edith Austin. On the same day, on page eight, the newspaper reported on the frozen out boatmen of Worcester going about as Morris dancers um, trying to earn some money. So I think this, this is a thing that comes across more than once, that these different worlds could coexist in people's heads at the same time and not actually be connected. And th this, however, brings us back to the border, Morris and Bedlam. Um, the indications are, um, if you've read the book, you'll know that um, border Morris was originally known as Bedlam Morris, dances with sticks, to distinguish it from the earlier form of Morris with handkerchiefs. And it's an innovation dating from the late 17th century. In the later 19th century, it was performed, performed primarily by boatmen on the River Severn and by Shropshire Colliers. And by the end of the century, it was mainly a begging custom when they were out of work, um, either because of the river fro being frozen or because they were on strike, as we saw in that newspaper report. I don't have a picture from the later period, but here's one of Morris Dunting boatmen out of work. It says turned out Staffordshire Canal boatmen from earlier in the century. And uh, a local Staffordshire antiquary met some striking workers and described how divided into two parties they face each other in line and advance and retire, striking their batons together each time they meet after the fashion of the deadly combat. I asked one of them if they made the thing pay. Well, he said, we get our living. I suppose that's all we want. I wish I was out of it for one, but anything's better than nothing. So like the South Midlands, Morris, it had declined um, from an accepted celebration at the beginning of the century. That was this picture of Litchfield at around 1819 or so, um, to decline from a celebration into a begging custom and station. Time to go back to the Northwest. Um, in the first half of the century, Morris was mainly associated with rush cart processions, um, bringing rushes to strew on the church floor, but unlike in the South Midlands, where the demise of the Wits and Ale led to the decline of Morris dancing, in the Northwest, it survived all the way through the century as a general holiday pastime during wait weeks, and dancers also began to appear without rush carts. These guys, um, the Godley Hill Morris men, were instrumental in bringing about changes. They were founded in the 1860s um, with the rush carts, but they were apparently never associated with the kind of brawling and drunkenness that we enjoyed so much with the older teams. They started out, as I say, as a rush cart team. They were invited to take part in the Nutsford May Day procession. This is folding them in for that May Day celebration of the kind we had at Buxton. Um, the invitation was apparently based on the chance circumstances that one of the team's leaders came from and that family in Nutsford. Um, Godley Hill first appeared at Nutsford in 1878 and reports commented on the fact that the procession included a body of genuine modest dancers. Um, in 1880, the Altrincham Temperance Band furnished music for the modest dancers, brackets, adults, whose attractive dress and well-executed movements made them one of the most effective pre features in the procession. So this is to some extent a reaction against the prettified Morris of the Buxton kind. And it reflects this, the same thing we saw in the newspaper account, um, where it said that you know the, the music in the concert was not as good as our rush card. There was a distinct pride in performance still in the Northwest um, and, and in their own local traditions. Now, in 1890, um, the Leyland May procession organisers decided they wanted modest dancers just like Nutsford's, and they sent a delegation down to Nutsford to learn the dance from the Godley Hill men. And here are the Leyland modest men at their first appearance in 1890. They were an enormous success, and when the, within the decade they had spawned literally dozens of teams in the Northwest. Costumes were a significant part of the attractiveness of displays, and teens went out of their way to refresh and renew them. Spanish bolero jackets became popular, and here are the Preston Royal Men wearing them in 1893. And almost all the new teams used wands, the big short ribbon sticks, like the Godley Hill Men, and unlike the slings of the older Rushcart teams. So 
again, here we are in the 1890s when Morris was supposedly wholly discontinued. And there are literally dozens of teams springing up in that decade uh, in the Northwest. And very soon there were men's teams, boys' teams, women's girl teams, girls' teams and mixed teams. Here's the mixed team at Old Lily Edge, just 12 years after Leyland initiated the Morris boom in the region. And the dance was undergoing rapid evolution. This was primarily the old Northwest Morris, supercharged with the infusion of new ideas from a variety of sources, including May carnivals and other dance forms, and with significant community support. Now, although Morris in the theatres had a long history independent of the traditions in the community, and in the Northwest, there was an interesting blend of community and theatre-based Morris. And the Tiller Girls um, were formed in Manchester in 1890, and here they are performing in a Cardiff entertainment in 1894. And you can see the distinct similarities in the costume with the Spanish bolero type costumes and the ribboned ones of the newer northwest side. And uh, when they performed in the Isle of Man in 1893, um, the, the newspaper reports the Morris dances, the dance of the troubadours, the rainbow dance and other scenes, the ballet by the Tiller troops are quite superb. So you've got the Tiller girls. Um, another aspect was the Mock Morris dancers at festivals in the Northwest as an affectionate parody. They, may, they emerged very soon after Leyland kicked off in 1890, and quite often they performed in association with what were called jazz bands, these were comic bands, kazoo bands. And um, this is a bit later, I haven't got another picture, this is the Blackburn um, comic jazz band in 1924. Um, in this picture, the dancers themselves aren't tagged as comic, but the band is. You can see the, the sign at the top there, the Blackburn Comic Jazz Band and Prize Morris Dancers. And um, in other re and reports of other occasions by this group, the dancers also are tagged as comic. There are hardly any descriptions of comic Morris dancers. The best is from the Chorley Roll Fe Rose Festival in 1892, when we're told much diversion was caused by mock Morris dancers, who in goggles, swallowtail coats, and coarse canvas gaiters trimmed with dainty lace and carrying bladders instead of wands, executed a series of movements of a grotesque character to music contributed by the band of the Cold Cream Guards, conducted by a Teutonic looking hair from bassoon, several members of which played concertinas while the bulk had dummy clarinets. And the performance later on in the proceedings um, describes the dancers belabouring each other with their bladders. Um, so again, it's Morris dancing gym, but not as we know it. And of course, the, the term was also being applied um, in ways which we might now consider to be inaccurate, but nonetheless, people were seeing this as Morris dancing. Any kind of May custom uh, could be seen as Morris dancing. Um, in London in 1886 on May Day, um, a, a correspondent was admiring of the dray horses being pulled uh, from the breweries, but complained that Morris dancing has for many years been monopolised by the riffraff of St Giles. On a cold May Day in 1896, the London correspondent of the Leicester Journal saw one or two poor little attempts by shivering children to revive the lost art of Morris dancing. And the overall impression from the capital is of a pitiable dying sweeps custom taken to be the last remnants of a more estimable Morris dancing tradition. This picture isn't from um, London, but it does show the sweeps Jack of the Green in Oxford in 1884. And the fiddler on the left hand side there is Pope Potter of Stanton Harcourt, who was a Morris fiddler. And of course, sword dancers were also called um, Morris dancers. At Annick Castle in 1895, a company of sword dancers from Ersden performed, as they had according to the newspaper since 1870, and the dance was described as a Morris dance. The 1876 report wrote quite plainly that the Morris dancers executed some capital sword dances. In more than one year, they were described as introducing several new and intricate figures. So here too, the dance was developing in response to public and popular demand. And here are the football results. Um, in 1892 and 1893, um, the 
a team called the Deepdale Morris Dancers played football mass matches within the Preston area, losing heavily on each recorded occasion. The North End Whites 5, Deepdale Morris Dancers 2, and Victoria Albion 4, Deepdale Morris Dancers 1, and in this fuller report on the right-hand side, and the Fullwood Rangers 5, Deepdale Morris Dancers 0. Um, so if you're filling in your pools, come to Coop and don't bet on the Deepdale Morris Dancers. Deepdale is coincidentally the home of Preston North End Football Club. The trouble is, there's no record of the Deepdale Morris Dancers ever doing any Morris dancing. They made well just to be in a football team and Morris Dancers might have been an evocative epithet like as in Wolverhampton Wanderers or Oldham Athletic or whatever. So um, again, this is the North West where it gets, it gets hard to, to work out exactly what's going on sometimes. I mean, there were other teams that definitely played football. In April 1893, the Preston Morris Dancers played in a charity football match at Everton. And the newspaper report says they displayed more than a superficial knowledge of the game. And they went on that same evening to perform as an interlude to the pantomime Little Bull Peep at the Rotunda Theatre in Liverpool. And cycling was also popular at the time. The Cone Royal Morris Dancers had a prize winning cycle team and the Ormskirk Cycling Club had a team of Morris Dancers. So basically in the Northwest, you could not move for Morris Dancers. And so although Sharp had not seen anything quite like the Headington Quarry Morris Dancers um, on that day in 1899, there were a myriad ways in which he and his fellow Victorians could have encountered Morris dancing, as well as surviving just in the South and West Midland and elsewhere. It was being performed in carnivals all over the country. It was being performed by professional dancing troops. It was in dancing schools, at society balls, on the stage, in choral pieces, in children's action songs at schools and in annual school concerts. And above all, it was being performed in the northwest of England, um, in rush cart processions, civic carnivals, and every aspect of civic life spilling over into comedy entertainments and sporting events. And I haven't even mentioned the pubs named after Morris dancers, or the half a dozen racehorses, champion bud and prize tub, all bearing that name. So I, I can understand how these other Morrises could occupy different parts of the mind and not be connected up. But Sharp undoubtedly knew about the Northwest Morris from an early stage, possibly even before 1899. Um, in fact, his, his, um, his, the operetta he wrote in the 1890s, Sylvia has a Morris dance in it. But um, you know, more to the point, his brother-in-law, Walter Birch, um, lived in Walton Ladale, just outside Preston in the heart of the Morris dancing area and Sharp visited him quite often and that's where he found his favourite singer Matty Kay. Um, and so I, the conclusion I really draw is that Sharp um, saw Morris dancing not just as or possibly not mainly as a choreographic art form but as a trigger for the evocation of all sorts of other emotions about a romantic Englishness um, into which Northwest Morris forms did not fit. Um, so you could say that you know Morris dancing was nowhere in 1899, but at the same time, you know, it was absolutely everywhere. So thank you very much. That's it. You want to stop screen sharing, Mike, and we'll have some Q and A. If um, yeah. people want to put any Q and A into the uh, chat or raise yeah, your I'm hand. I've got one question, which oh, I think I've answered. Uh, it's only, is there a picture of the girls at Buxton? Yes, and it was the one on the right where they were dancing around the maypole that I showed you way back when. Um, but yeah, but that's the only that's the only one I know of the time. And it is, um, I, I, I don't know of any photographs of them at, at that stage. And uh, um, there may well be some. I just may just... Uh, go go and look in um, Derbyshire Record Office. They might first, might well find something there from um, the late nineteenth or early twentieth centuries. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop the screen share. Okay. Right there we are. Okay. Brilliant. So we'll have an applause at the end. So um, after the Q and A. So who would like to kick us off with some questions? Go on, Derek. 
Nobody. Stephen, oh, go on. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. Really enjoyed that. Um, excellent and uh, and um, uh, illuminating a, a you know an interesting uh, a patch of the uh, of the or section of the Morris history. There's an important element in all this that you, you bring up about um, the various kinds of May celebrations, and I. Um, so I come from Bedfordshire, <laughs> where my grandmother used to make the clangor. <laughs> and because uh, the the big thing um, in mid Bedfordshire um, was the uh, there was there were these May Queen uh, things that went on, and you would have May pageants and some you know mostly primary schools, which I understand came from a, a particular thing which uh, John Ruskin uh, uh, really promoted. Uh, this uh um uh, sort of various elements of this for primary schools in his first uh teachers training college at whitelands um but uh, you know i see a lot of uh elements there of you know, what what people were doing in villages to do or celebrating uh may um and you know what how you go when you go look right the way back through um uh the earlier parts of, of what you write in the book and what john wrote in his there was this uh connection with the may stuff way back in the 17th 16th century even um mostly around whitson rather than than the beginning of may but um have you got a, a good picture of how uh these may different kinds of may uh pageants were working that's um it's a good one, Stephen. I, I think my the short answer is, I wish I had a much better picture. Um, there's a lot which where you're sort of inferring from newspaper reports, where the newspaper report presumes everybody knows what they what they're talking about, but now we don't, <laughs> and so um, you know, there, there there was a lot going on, and I think it happened in many different kinds of ways. I mean, there's the, the whole business at St. Mary Cray, for example, um, in the late late 19th century, where the local mill owner, Mr. Joins, Joyner, um, starts up a May festival, which includes, um, you know, he, he gets down Paul Valentine from one of the London theatres as his dancing master. And there's quite detailed descriptions of some of the dances that they do there. Um, a, a lot of it is imagination. Um, or rather, it's, they're not drawing from ancient roots in the community. I mean, I I think there's very little to suggest a continuity of May customs involving Morris from the 16th century into the 19th century. I think it had essentially died out. Mm -hmm. um, the continuing May customs, such as um, you know Helston and so on. Um, well, as you know, the, the the tune there might well have links to Morris, but um, there was not there was nothing strong there. There's certainly nothing where we can say, "Ah, oh, yes, I can follow this thread along, and it takes me from 16th century, 17th century into the 19th century." I think a lot of it was um, from the beginnings of the antiquaries' interest at the end of the 18th century, where they pick up, and of course they look at literary sources. And uh, they they pick on phrases like a modest for May Day in Shakespeare. They there are a few go to sources. You go to Shakespeare. You go to classical references, um, and you go to some of the early dictionaries and so on. But um, they they were constructing something based on very limited real knowledge of what was going on. And they and so people then build on that. I think one of, one of the telling things is that you have Francis Douse writing his Ancient English Morris Dance paper in 1807, which is a really good factual historical account insofar as he could manage it then. And then you've got Joseph Strutt writing um, you know, his, his novel Queen Who Hall, which is a, a fictional reimagining of uh, what this kind of thing was like. And Strutt was 80% imagination and 20% based on sources. 
but it's Strutt who fires the imagination more. And it, people look to Strutt, and uh, in the book I've got this picture that was in the Victorian Albert of someone's imagining of a May Day, which is obviously directly taken from Strutt. So these imaginings were very powerful, and people thought that they, would, they had historical warrant to do it. But um, it was based on very fragmentary source and limited sources, and people necessarily built on their imagination um, to do it. So, and how they did that, I think, could vary from place to place. So I'm, you know, th there are different ways in, in which it could be imagined and achieved. Uh, and uh, we don't know enough now, I think, to be certain. We can see these things happening in Buxton. We can see um, Yardley Gobian was another place where you had a, uh, an, an excellent combination of um, an invented imagining of May Day coupled with some Brackley Morris, coupled with some Northwest Morris, um, all in one man's imagining. And so people brought their own knowledge to it. Sometimes they had some knowledge, like Thomas Caddy and Brackley and um, you know, various other Northwest teams where they, you know, guy says, I invented it all myself. But we know he didn't. We know he, he, he imbibed and absorbed lots of it from what was going on around him. Um, but now, now I, I, I realise I'm waffling a bit, but it's because we are, you know, we are on very uncertain ground because the sources don't tell us the kind of information we really want to know now um, about what it was really like. Mm. Yeah, I, it makes me you know, wish I'd I had um, you know, written down what my great aunts <laughs> when they described when they were when they were children in the nineteenth century doing May pageants and things like that, and what they did. Yeah, um, but still, yeah, great. Hi, who's next? Well, obviously, too done too good a job marking your book. Know, obviously, yeah. <laughs> could I could I just just um, mention something picking up on that that May Day reference? Um, because what what one of the key points in, in, in the revival, as I understand it, was when Thomas Carter um, went to, I think it was Bampton, because he, he'd he been charged by um, Percy Manning to go and collect artefacts. Is that right? And, and that he yeah. was looking for um, May garlands and things, and he actually came across um, the Morris dancers at, at Bampton, not actually on May Day, but on on um, Whitson. Is, 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 have I remembered that right? Yeah, that, that's that's pretty much accurate, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, that's um, yeah. Percy Manning. He starts off. He sees children singing a May song and cutting a May garland in Watford in 1893, and this fires his imagination. And he uh, he was staying with his mother in Watford. He was living in Oxford himself. And so he goes back to Oxford and he'd been working with this guy called Thomas Carter, who was absolutely fascinating. And for those who are really interested, I wrote an article on him a few years ago. Um, it was absolutely fascinating creature, self-taught labourer, highly intelligent, highly sympathetic. And um, Manning employed him to go around originally collecting um, archaeological objects, you know, um, Neolithic flints or things like that. And then um, Manning puts him also to collecting things relating to May Day. And wherever Carter goes, he, he quite often, he, he finds the oldest person in the village and goes and chats to them. And he, he, he chats all around the subject as well. He, and he always reports little snippets back to Manning. And so he, he gets to Bampton. And here he finds out that the, the May garlands aren't brought out on May Day. They're brought out on Whitson, same time as the Morris dancers. The person he talks to is Hannah Wells, who is Jinky Wells' grandmother. And um, he, um, she tells him, uh, Manning was also looking at ghost stories. She tells him a ghost story. She tells him about the May Girl and she tells him about the Morris dancers. And as soon as he hears about them, Manning wants um, Morris regalia as well. Mm -hmm. And then um, he uh, 
he exhibit he, he starts gathering Morris regalia he puts them into an exhibition within a few months there's one wonderful quote in there where he exhibits what he describes as a um Morris costume taken from the body of a live Morris dancer and uh, um but yeah and that but that's how he gets into it and because Carter's he sends out Carter with a list of questions which who was in the team um what team was it when did they last dance who was in the team who where are they now um, what did they do who was the squire who was the musician and almost invariably you know is there an, an interesting anecdote you can tell me as well so this is how Carter went round and this is how um he collected the information that Keith Chandler made a great use of in his book on South Midlands Morris because mm -hmm. uh, because we've got the names of the dancers um you can go and look them up in censuses and the like and find out what they were doing uh, but yes that's that's basically how Manning got into Morris it was because at Bampton the May Garlands were out on Whit Monday hmm. so, so that, that that was the antiquarian picking it up from the yeah. tradition rather than the other way around at, at yeah. that stage yes yes and, and of course the, 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 the other thing that sticks in my mind with the connection with May Day was that is that curious anecdote that Sharp puts into the Morris book from Ducklington yeah right, 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 right. Right. Um, which I don't think was connected with May Day itself but was 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 connected that, that there was obviously a strong traditional element that, that seemed to be founded in the in the village tradition that, that linked the two things there yeah, the, the Maypole isn't uh, it isn't strongly associated with May Day it's, it's, it's most strongly associated with a, a Whitson Ale and when you hold the Whitson Ale um, and uh, I think it's just the, the link with May puts this in my people put him oh Maypole May Day they mm -hmm. make it but Maypoles were at any time of year well I, <laughs> they tended to be at Whitson when you're having an ale because it was the symbol that you're holding an ale basically mm -hmm. No, it's brilliant. No, thank, thanks very much. I, mean, uh, I particularly jo enjoyed the, the sort of rounding up at the end of, of, of your book, um, which sort of pulled the, the whole structure together and, and brought it up to the current day, which was something that, that obviously John Forrest's book didn't do because it, it, it sort of um, disappeared um, in, 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 the seven, in 1750. I mean, I've, I've written a different book from John's book, deliberately so. <laughs> Any more questions? No? Okay, so um, thank you very much to Mike. If you could unmute yourself. Oh, well, we've got, we got one. Keith, go on. Oh, Keith LaSalle's here. Talk, talking of Cotswold, Morris, uh, I mean, we don't know when it really crystallised into a six-month set with the musician at the top and an extraneous character or two, but I, I'm sort of getting the impression that the Cotswold dancers that Cotswold sides do now are more or less the same as they were 150 years ago. And, and possibly as much as 200 years ago. I mean, do you think that Morris has ever stood still for this long before? Um, it, well, if, if you mean by this long, do you mean since the revival? No, it hasn't. <laughs> uh, I think it was always evolving. And, um, you know, you can see that in the tunes that are brought in, some of which are 19th century tunes. And so, yes, yeah, some are 17th century tunes too. But... Um, when you think about the different, um, think of the different teams that are sort of, sort of often called traditional teams in the sense that they were still going around when Sharp met them, um, like Bampton, and like Headington, and like Abingdon, and Ensham, and Chipping Camden, for that matter, although the, the way in which they were going was different in each case. But those, things, those five teams, you know, although to an outsider, those dances and styles of dancing may look very similar. If you're a Morris dancer, you know that they're very different. If you compare Ensham with Chipping Camden, if you compare Bampton with Headington, they're quite different styles of dancing. And yet 50 years before that, they were all visiting each other at Wits and Ales and you could get teams, you know, members of one team dancing with another, combined teams like Longburn, Lois Well and so on. 
and they, they shared dances like Trunkel's um, as a competition dance. And I think that most of the variation and difference that you see between things like Bampton and Headington Quarry or Bampton and Abingdon, they probably arose in that last 50 year period after teams stopped seeing each other regularly at competitions in Wits and Ales and similar events, and then began to evolve separately or just doing their own thing over 50 years. And in 50 years, those styles had radically changed. Um, I think before that, there was probably much more cohesiveness. So up to about 1850 and more, if you think of the, the teams that uh, like Longborough and Leddington and places like that, they're probably closer to the older forms. But at the same time, those competitions that produced dances like Trunkles, they were adding to the development of the dance. And a lot of the complexity may have arisen you know, just in the 18th century. And, uh, and in, in the book, I put forward the view that, you know, Bed Bedlam Morris comes in and changes South Midlands Morris, which was purely handkerchiefs, into the mixed South Midlands Morris of sticks and handkerchiefs. And that's something that happens you know, possibly towards the end of the 18th century. Um, so it, it's always developing and always changing. Um, and I think that we, you know, until the last 100 years, We've never been able to record Morris dances in sufficient detail, especially with film, to know so that we could then copy the movements. And then, until then, it was somebody teaching the next person along, teaching the next person along, and probably getting changed every time. Um, so it's, it's an inherently very fluid art form. And uh, I suspect that, you know, every 50 years, if you sort of take 50 year snapshots, it was probably very different at least time period in that snapshot and um it's just that we don't know about it <laughs> i thank you can i keep going or is there a yeah. cue to ask questions no, no yeah i keep going for now keith and then stephen's got another one but keep so going i i obviously know your book is limited mainly to english but you do make reference to morris in wales and in ireland uh and you can't cover uh everything about morris but in ireland I, i've seen the wexford mummers dance and their name is totally misleading because they don't do anything that we would call mumming uh i don't know if you know the dance and would you categorize that as a morris dance i i don't, I don't know it keith to be honest much to my shame i don't i don't know it um so i'd, I'd better go and look at it um, I, be I, I, to know when it arose uh, well, I, I don't want to be the expert, but uh, it, it apparently arose when a Portuguese sailor was shipwrecked at Wexford and he taught them this dance. Oh. So the story goes. Uh, yes. It's that kind of story, though, isn't it, I think? <laughs> yes. But it, it's quite an interesting dance, which I... I I recommend people looking it's obviously on youtube but also in wales where i am you you refer to caddy ha i don't know you can be forgiven if you're not familiar with the dancey cassie guy or the from nankaru to do with him sorry I, i'm not right I, I was going to ask if you categorize that as a modest dance but that's uh... no i'm afraid i'm I, I i'll stick to what i know keith right yep <laughs> Okay, Stephen. Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, I was uh, thinking about um, when John Forrest uh, published his book, um, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, at that time, uh, you know, most Morris teams were going around saying, uh, we're an ancient fertility, pagan fertility dance in our, our origins. And uh, we, we dance to um, uh, bring good luck and fertility and things like that. And um, so um, I was really aware that not not a huge number of people at the time read the book. And so uh, I set out with a group of others to set up uh, Rose Moresk to try and just publish, uh, you know, uh, promote uh, some different look at the history of Morris and maybe what did Morris look like at that time? Um, that was 1510. And then Reading Morris, which was a similar... A project looking at church morris that time 
having done your um book now new book 20 something years later um what what could we do to um uh illustrate a, a, a you know a, another period of morris <laughs> to give a, a better understanding <laughs> yeah um that's a, a, another interesting one um i i think that it it would be interesting and i don't know how one would do it to start looking to, to look if we could at the period when i think morris began to diversify more which is after the restoration um when you get things like bedlam morris coming in but also the fact that um you know i, I think i think to say in the book that until then although we don't know too much about the dance we haven't a lot of evidence that it was different things in different kinds of things in different places but then when you come back again in the 19th century references late 18th century references kick in you do find it's different so you know what happened in the meantime is you know are we looking for the missing link form you know an archaeopteryx or a, you know the the pill down man version probably of a, of a fraud um but uh, I, I I just think one of the things that sort of struck me as I was sort of looking at the overview was that on the fringes um in places like well, when you've got the Forest of Dean and you've got the Kadiha and you've got Derbyshire Morris all of which are sort of um, handkerchief based and but simpler than the South Midlands Morris and I was thinking you know are they as it were quite often you get um, I've, I've got linguistic background, language use background, and I keep thinking you often get, you know, um, development in the centre and peripheral form, things at the edges tend to stay the same. And I was just wondering if you could work something around there. It would, I think, be even more invention than some of the 19th century Mayday ones. But if you looked at those kinds of things and decided, you know, what, what do they have in common? Because what they have in common may be what was there mm. at the beginning because I, I rather suspect that the more complex dances in which an ale morris in cotswold morris um are related elaboration um that they are the ones when you've got the wits and airs you've got the competition you've got people like um lady from in 17 saying we've got wits and airs all about us you know and you get things of 20 teams turning up at wits and airs or however many teams competing at dover's hill um and um I think that's when a lot of the complexity probably developed in South Midlands, Morris. So possibly looking at that period, trying to reconstruct what we know, both from the contemporary sources, which is very little, and from looking at what's, what the different flavours are, especially around the edges, you might begin to get an idea of what Morris was like in the late 17th century. Mm. Um, speculation. Pure That'd speculation. be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, just a quickie. Um, Keith Lasalle just mentioned about the um, the Wexford Mummers. Um, if anyone is interested in that, there's a fantastic book called The Mummers of Wexford by James Powell. I don't, can you see that on the? There we are, Duncan. Yeah. yeah. So um, that that is a must for anyone and there are a lot there's lots of plays in it and dancing so Excellent. just just for information thank you thank you peter that it any more questions i just say this is the pedant of cheshire here saying it's peckforton not peckforton or however you pronounced it Oh, okay. Next time you do a talk, Peckerton, yeah, it's like people saying Todmorden wrongly. It always annoys me. They say Todd Morden, and it's not Todd Morden. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Okay. Any final observations or questions? Can't. No. no. Yeah, no. Okay, so if you could all unmute yourselves, please, and uh, we'll give Mike a round of applause. Okay.